Okay, hello everybody. This is uh, Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Uh, welcome to this episode of Bible Talk with Brother Luke. First thing I want to do is show you my shirt. See here? I am a heavy drinker. Does that shock you? <laughs> Jesus said, whoever thirsts, come to me and drink. And uh, that's uh, right here on the back of the shirt. That's what Jesus says. So I want to I want to drink up this living water of Jesus. Uh, drink up the Word of God. Drink up my Savior God Jesus. And and uh, I, I hope that you want to do the same thing. Uh, tonight uh, is uh, on the agenda is uh, continuing to study the Book of Proverbs. Uh, we're about in the middle of uh, chapter 19. I think we're going to pick up with verse 8 tonight. Uh, but uh, first, uh, let me ask uh, Brother Eric to say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. It's me again, the homo. And I just wanted to mention that we don't call Brother Luke uh, Luke Boozer for nothing. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny, yeah. Yes. Uh, well, uh, I remember uh, when I was a very young man, you know, I thought that, you know, that uh, I should try to prove myself and, and live up to my last name, Boozer. And uh, I, I tried it, but it turns out that uh, um, it just, drinking just doesn't come naturally to me. You know, I mean, I, like I had a beer today after my round of golf, visiting with my friends, I had a beer. And I enjoy having a beer or having a glass of wine or a drink of whiskey. I, I enjoy it. Uh, I'd like to drink a drink every day. but. I try to not drink it mainly because there are the calories in alcohol, uh, but uh, I think it's probably a good thing to, to have uh, maybe an alcoholic beverage each day. The Bible does not tell us to not drink alcoholic beverages. It says don't be drunks, and that's one of the things we'll learn as we go through the book of Proverbs. It talks about drunkards. Uh, but um, now, uh, some people, uh, they, uh, they seem to be able to have uh, more tolerance and more uh, capacity for drinking. But, brother, I hate to disappoint you, but <laughs> I tried, but I just don't have that much of a capacity for it. All right, uh, let's go into uh, Proverbs. We'll, we'll look at these uh, verses in Proverbs in the KJV. Uh, I'm a KJV first, just so let's look at the KJV first. Uh, I expect, though, that there'll be some of these verses that are um, a little challenging, the language, so I, well, I'll have to probably look at the Amplified also. Um, I like the Amplified because it's it's in simple language, but it amplifies, it expounds upon it, so I, I find it to be helpful. All right, so let me read this, chapter 19, beginning with verse 8. He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul, he that keepeth understanding shall find good. Now, I think I'm looking at the following verse, and I'm looking at the previous verse, and they, uh, as we oftentimes find in the book of Proverbs, uh, many times one verse is not connected to the verse before or after. A lot of times verses stand alone. And this is one of the unique things about the book of Proverbs. It's um, all the other books of the Bible, I, I can't think of uh, any other exception. Uh, even Psalms, every Psalm is a, is a story about a certain topic and, and um, a theme. Uh, and, and, and the other books like, you know, uh, Genesis and Exodus and Deuteronomy and all, the, all these books, they are... Um, uh, his stories uh, about history, real people, real events, and they are chronological. They they uh, they uh, they make sense, but the Book of Proverbs is not a continuous story telling a particular tale. Uh, it is it is a series of verses. Sometimes there may be two or three or four or five verses strung together that are all part of the same thought, and oftentimes uh, there's one thought. That's that's stated in a single verse, and I, I so that's one of the unique things about the Pro Book of Proverbs. And I think this verse here is pro is, 
probably fits in that category. I don't see a connection to the verse before and after. But let me read it again, and then I get to ask uh, Brother Eric to comment on it. It says again in verse 7, no, verse 8, He that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul. He that keepeth understanding shall find good. All right, brother, what does that mean? Absolutely, Brother Luke. Uh, pretty straightforward there. Uh, not much to comment on uh, at this point on that. Well, what do you think it means when it says he loveth his own soul? If, if, if I get wisdom, I love my own soul. How does, how does that, th those two ideas uh, fit together? What, uh, I, mean, I think I understand it, but what's your reaction? That reminds me of a previous proverb that states, uh, he that is wise is wise for himself. And so uh, wisdom does a body good. If you love your and oh, everybody naturally loves themselves, I believe. Uh, what do you think about that? Yeah, well, what first of all, the concept and the term loving your own soul. Uh, um, well, we, what is what is a, a human soul? Uh, you know. I believe in the, in, the, in the Bible, it says there are three aspects to each person. We have body, soul, and spirit. The body, that's easy to understand. You know, it's a collection of, of uh, you know, a, a DNA instructions and, and cells and then tissues and organs and systems all working together to be a, a container and vehicle for my soul and spirit. Uh, Paul called it a, the body a tent. See, he, he was a tent maker. And so it, it, in his mind, he related to it in that way. He, you, you, you live inside the tent. Uh, and we actually live inside this tent, our physical bodies. And it's just a temporary time that we're occupying these bodies. In eternity, we will live in a new tent, which is a body, but it'll be glorified and eternal that never gets sick and old and dies. And I look forward to that. Uh, but... So we, it's easy to understand what a body is. It's, it's the body is the vehicle that transports our self, our self, our soul. When you said, does, if a person loves themselves, well, when you say love yourself, that's what the soul is. The soul is the true self. And, and, and to me, soul and mind are interchangeable because a soul is, is a person's uh, thoughts, emotions, um, consciousness, awareness, uh, the memories, all those things are um, aspects of the human soul. And of course, the spirit is separate from the soul in that the spirit, I think I've said this many times in the past, but man's spirit, uh, it, it, Adam and Eve, they, their spirits were connected to God. When God breathed into them, he breathed life into them, and they were brought dirt and he formed the dirt the mud and then he breathed into them and they were quickened brought to life by the, the breath of god and they had a they were a living soul and they had a spirit but when they rebelled against god because of their sin the the holy spirit of god that lived in them broke away and there were separation because of sin uh, and 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 when Brother Eric and I put our faith in Jesus, the Holy Spirit come, came and united with us, quickened our spirit. We are born again spiritually, uh, and, and now uh, we have live spirits uh, connected to the Holy Spirit. So that's body, soul, and spirit. But when you talk about loving yourself, I think that really is referring to soul. That's what your true self really is, your soul. Um, now, you talk about do you think everybody really loves themselves? Uh, I don't know. There probably are some people that are damaged and psychologically, and they, they really do hate themselves. But uh, it says here in this verse, whoever loveth his soul, let me read it again. Uh, uh, he that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul. So the way you phrase it is if you really love yourself, 
you will want wisdom because wisdom will be a great blessing in your life. That's that's how I see it. Yes, Brother Luke, I agree. Uh, if you truly love yourself, uh, you will search out wisdom and you will find God as Scripture says so. Uh, okay. Okay, so now uh, on the... F uh, he that getteth wisdom loveth his own soul. Now he that keepeth understanding shall find good. Uh, do you do you uh, see a clear difference between wisdom and understanding? Oh, absolutely. That's very elementary. Uh, we know that uh, wisdom is uh, knowledge uh, in action. Uh, so to speak. I didn't realize you had some muted there. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, a, a lot of people gain understanding, but they don't apply the understanding in their life. They don't put that understanding into action, as you said. And so if we're wise, we not only know things, but we apply it in a right way so that, uh, you know, we get good results out of our lives. And so that that's kind of what this, this verse is, is all about here, is that uh, um, he, if, you, if you love yourself, you, you will want and receive wisdom. And also... Uh, you uh, understanding if you have understanding and you apply it through wisdom then you shall find good you will be get good things in your life let me look at that in the amplified before we move on just to see if they have any insight the way they wrote it uh, that uh, might help us I do think your first reaction to this verse was uh, corrected it is a pretty straightforward verse to compared to many that we've been discussing Okay, and the Amplified says, He who gains wisdom and good sense loves and preserves his own soul. He who keeps understanding will find good and prosper. Yeah. So obviously that uh, that's a simple way of explaining it that, uh, uh, you know, uh, agrees with our conclusions. Okay, I'll move on now to the, uh, the next verse. I'll go back to look at it, the KJV first. Um, King James. Okay, verse 9. A false witness shall not be unpunished, and he that speaketh lies shall perish. Didn't we have a verse like that last uh, last study about false witnesses being punished? Oh, wow. That's very intriguing, Brother Luke. As a matter of fact, verse 5 requires the exact same words except for the very last word yeah yeah okay so verse 5 I'll read it then it says a false witness shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall not escape and then in verse 9 it's repeated a false witness shall not be unpunished and he that speaketh lies shall perish so we discussed that verse uh, basically last last study, uh, and it's uh, uh, I guess you can go back to the last last uh, video. I think we talked actually quite a bit about this verse, but uh, no need to go over that again. Uh, I'll go to verse ten. Delight is not seemly for a fool, <laughs> much less for a servant to have rule over princes. Delight is not seemly for a fool. Okay, brother. Can you can you explain that one to me? Explain it. Uh, I'm lost, brother Luke. Uh, I'm gonna have to hand this one over to my lawyers. Okay. Uh, it's it. I think it's. Uh, and when it says it, it is not seemly, it's it's not like the right thing. Uh, it's not. It doesn't fit. It, it's, it it doesn't go correctly. For a fool 
to have delight, it doesn't make a lot make sense. Um, because if you're a fool, you're probably not going to have delight. You're going to have despair and because you're always doing foolish things. Uh, but I'll have to look at the Amplified and see if that's in agreement with what I said. But, but it says, much less for a servant to have rule over princes. It's, it's just not right. I mean, it, 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 it just doesn't make sense for a servant to rule over a prince. Let me see how it's phrased in the Amplified here. Okay. Luxury is not fitting for a fool, much less for a slave to rule over princes. So do you think that uh, my interpretation and explanation of that, uh, does it make sense to you now? Absolutely. It was much better than the amplified version, as a matter of fact. All right. Well, that's what we are trying to do. Each of us are are amplifying it in our own way. All right. So now let's go back to the KJV and look at the uh, the next verse, and it will be verse uh, eleven. The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. Brother, I have a sneaky feeling that this is a verse you probably have a particular love for. Absolutely. Absolutely. Especially the second half, because uh, the first half uh, I have to deal with constantly, and uh, it's a struggle for me. Uh, being an angry man, I confess, I'm guilty. I'm an angry man when I'm walking in the flesh. So pray for me that I won't walk in the flesh. Now, on the second half of that verse, uh, and it is his glory to pass over a transgression. And uh, every time... We choose to walk in the spirit rather than walking in the flesh. Uh, we become stronger by that grace and glory that God gives us. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Yeah. Um, I really like the way it's phrased about, about it's, it's our glory because... And, you know, sometimes I feel a little bit um, self-conscious or leery about complimenting someone because I'm always worried that they might misinterpret as being a flatterer. And, you know, in Proverbs, of course, it, it's always telling us to don't be a flatterer and beware of the flatterers. But... Uh, Brother Eric, you know, you are particularly, I think, a particularly forgiving person, and you particularly want to help reconciliation between not only yourself and others, but, but between other parties. When you see that there's strife and division, you, you want to help in reconciliation. And so I, I knew that this would mean a lot to you, this particular verse. And it really is, as it says here, uh, it's a glory. It says, it is his glory to pass over a transgression. Now, I think passing over could mean that if some tra someone transgresses against me, then I will just say, okay, I'm not going to hold it against them. I'm just, gonna, I'm just not going to let it bother me. I'm not going to let it come between us. I'm not going to let it cause a division and strife. I'm just going to, like, ignore it, you know, pass over it. Uh, or, or it could be also that, like forgiveness, that, okay, there's been a, a transgression, there's a division, but I, I don't want the division. I'm, I'm, I'd rather forgive them and, and uh, pass over it and just, let's, let's just act like it never happened and, and uh, have peace. But when a person does that, when they're forgiving and they, and they uh, dis dismiss these transgressions, 
and don't hold it against other people. Uh, what that's what is now what God has done for us. He He's not holding our sins against us. And the only one that truly has glory and deserves glory is our great Savior God Jesus. All glory, all praise to Jesus. But when when a, a person actually applies this to their life then uh, it says here that it's it's a, it's a glorious thing. Brother? Uh, yes, Brother Luke, and I believe when Jesus prayed uh, in John 17, uh, he uh, mentioned that uh, when he is glorified, God is glorified. And so uh, it is with us. Uh, when we pass over transgressions and we're forgiving and... Uh, that is our glory, and uh, Jesus is glorified in that, and the Father is glorified in that. Yeah, the and the and the first part of the verse, um, when it says, "The discretion of a man deferreth his anger," uh, you, you know, uh, it is our discretion to uh, not get angry. Okay, you know, let's say our instincts. Our instincts, the natural man in us, naturally gets angry over something. But it's up to us to decide, really. We get, it says, we have discretion. So we get to decide if we're going to let this anger really come out and let it continue, or if we're going to exercise uh, control over it and, and suppress the anger. Uh, so we should defer the anger, we should set it aside. Angers. Now, I was talking to you earlier before we we started this broadcast. I was talking about uh, me being on this hangout yesterday with uh, some brothers in in some uh, uh, Calvinists, and I, I I told you that it just kind of makes me sick. I even get like angry, and I, it's, it's hard for me to be patient, and. Uh, I, I, be, when I hear something so absurd and 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 uh, sorry, uh, stupid, uh, s s when someone espouses Calvinist doctrines, uh, and it, it's in my na I naturally get angry, and I I, I, I pray that uh, you know that that, that doesn't happen. I I, I want to be calm, and I want to I don't want to let that come out. But there are certain things that just instantly make me angry but there is a place for some anger too and i, I don't know where to cite it but uh, uh I, I think that in the scriptures we can find verses that talk about righteous indignation righteous anger uh god is gets has righteous anger he's angry about certain things and he's justified in it and uh even saints even believers in jesus we we are justified in being angry about some things. But the problem is the natural man, we tend to get angry over things that, that we, we ne should not necessarily be angry over. All right, I'll move on, brother. Anything else on that? Um, well, brother Luke, uh, I feel we should be angry at certain things like uh, people that are lost and dying and going to hell and people that pervert the true gospel of Jesus Christ, things like that, uh, I'm more than happy to get angry about. Back to you. Yeah, um, well, since I brought up this uh, the Calvinism here in this example I just gave you, I'll, I'll, I'll tell you briefly why it, um, it, ang it immediately angers me is that um, God, God Almighty, our, our Savior Jesus, has certain um, um, aspects, characteristics, and, and, and character, character and a, a certain nature. And he, he is, uh, it even says he is love. He is love. Not he's loving, but he is love. So this is so innate and, and so, so much of who God is. Uh, 
and and he is um, merciful. And he's just, and he's gracious. These are qualities, characteristics, and this is the nature of God. And what Calvinism does, though, is it attacks the character and nature of God, the God that I love, the God in the Bible that is described by those words, those adjectives, those qualities. And yet, in Calvinism, I would have to believe that that God would create people, the vast majority of people he would create, and never even allow them to be saved. Uh, he would create people without a free will, without the ability to make a decision for themselves. He would control every action, every thought and every action that they do, so that every time any of us sin, God made us do it, and we wouldn't have anything to say about it. God makes us sin, and then he selectively picked out a few, and he says, I'm going to save you guys, but the rest of you, I'm going to make you sin, and then when you die, I'm going to judge you and find you guilty and punish you in hell. And that's not the God of the Bible. That is some kind of sadistic, perverted version of God that even more resembles Satan. But in the Calvinism, even Satan would be an innocent party because even everything Satan does, he doesn't have a free will. God's making him do it too. So that's really why it kind of makes my blood boil. And I think it is a righteous indignation. It's a justified anger because it's an insult to God Almighty and his, his uh, nature and, and uh, character to turn him into some kind of evil, sadistic being that makes people sin and then finds them guilty for something he made them do and then punishes them for it. So that's why, you know, that particular thing is, it, it, it instantly kind of gets me my, uh, my dander up. And, all right, I didn't want to turn this into a Calvinism show, but uh, that's, uh, we're talking about deferring anger. It says here, The discretion of a man deferreth his anger, and yet sometimes we are justly angered, and there's righteous indignation. There are certain things that are so offensive, particularly what angers me is an attack on our, our God and Savior. All right, I'm going to move on to verse 12, unless you want to add anything to that, brother. So then, brother Luke, we are in agreement that love can be angry at times back to you yeah okay um now i'll go to the next verse uh, well let me look at that verse 11 in the amplified before we move on amplified verse 11 uh, it says, good sense and discretion make a man slow to anger. And it is his honor and glory to overlook a transgression or an offense without seeking revenge and harboring resentment. So uh, that's pretty much what we've been saying. I'll read it again uh, because it kind of sums up everything we've said. Good sense and discretion make a man slow to anger. And it, it is his honor and glory to overlook a transgression or an offense without seeking revenge and harboring resentment. Okay, I'll go back now to the KJV and look at the next verse. Okay, verse 12. The king's wrath is as the roaring of a lion but his favor is as dew upon the grass <laughs> i think that's pretty straightforward too brother but what do you have to say about that it kind of reminds me of a hillbilly that likes to make all these uh similar similes sim similarity uh okay back to you Yeah, yeah, 
any particular hillbilly. I, I, I'm thinking about one in particular. Uh, okay, the king's wrath is as a roaring lion. Okay, so the king is capable of being very angry. But his favor is as dew upon the grass. So, boy, if you're dealing with a king, someone who has the sovereignty and control, and he, he, the sovereignty, and getting back to this uh, problem with Calvinism, is that they, they don't understand the sovereignty of God. See, sovereignty in Calvinism is, is like the, the, main, the main thing. I mean, you have TULIP, uh, all, all the aspects of, 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 of the five points of TULIP, uh, and that all every aspect makes me sick, but really the uh, there's another thing that's part of Calvinism that's not even part of Tulip that is the worst of all I think, and that is the sovereignty of God. They, see, God is sovereign, like this King is sovereign here. It says the King's wrath is as the roaring of a lion, but His favor is is as dew upon the grass. See, that king has sovereign, and he has the ability, whenever he decides, he can intervene in someone's life, and he can bless them, or he can punish them. But the king is not controlling every thought and every deed of his subjects. They're able to do whatever they want to do, but if he doesn't like it, he'll punish them. And if he, he likes it, he'll bless them. But he's not controlling every action. And that's what the way the true sovereignty of God is. God is sovereign in that he can, he has the power to intervene in, in any time he wants in any way. Uh, he has the ability to do anything he wants, but he is not exercising absolute control of every thought, word, and deed uh, of uh, every person and making us into like puppets and robots. So this verse here is... Uh, really, really good to understand what the true sovereignty of God really is. Brother, what do you say about that? I know very well, Brother Luke. Uh, Jesus sets us free. And whom the Son sets free is free indeed. And freedom is one of the seven thunders spoken into the new creation. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. All right, uh, okay, so I'm gonna, let me look at verse 12 in the Amplified. Uh, I think it's pretty clear, but sometimes the Amplified phrases it in a way that it's a particular blessing to, to see. Uh, it says verse 12, the king's wrath terrifies like the roaring of a lion but his favor is as refreshing and nourishing as dew on the grass. Okay, That's, as we said, it's a pretty straightforward verse, but I, I do think that the, understanding the sovereignty of this king here in Proverbs is a good, if you understand that, then you can see this, how God applies his sovereignty. He, even though he has the ability to do whatever he wants, one of the things he decided to do was give Brother Eric and Brother Luke and you free will so he didn't want to control us like robots okay so let me see let's go on to now verse 13 a foolish son is the calamity of his father and the contentions of a wife are a continual dropping <laughs> oh my God. i mean i'm a husband and I'm a father. And I'll tell you, I mean, everybody's done some foolish things in our lives. I mean, I mean I, I've done a lot of foolish things. Was, even today, sometimes I'll do something foolish. And in my youth, I did a lot of foolish things, the foolishness of youth. And, and my son is 35, and I've boasted about him numerous times on these broadcasts how how wise and successful he is, uh, even at his young age. But, you know, in his youth, he did some foolish things, too, as, as we all do. And, and when, when, when our sons or children do foolish things, it does break our heart. It is, a, it is a calamity to us. And then the contentions of a wife or a continual dropping, uh, you know, my, let me see, uh, it's 36 years. My wife and I got married 36 years ago. And we have definitely 
had some contentions the, and the contentions of a wife uh, the love I have for my wife has grown and grown and grown and my love and respect and admiration for her and yet over the years we have had some horrible contentions and it is definitely when you have uh, contentions of a wife <laughs> I don't know what continual dropping means dropping will have to get your opinion on that but boy, when your wife is contending against you, uh, it's it's a it's a, it's a horrible thing to, to deal with, um, brother. What's your your explanation of all that? Um, I guess I'm very fortunate, brother Luke. Uh, I cannot identify with uh, neither one of those cases, although I've had contentions uh, with my wife as well. Uh, but I love her dearly as well. And it's certainly not a continual dropping, which I imagine uh, others uh, have had to deal with. And, uh, you know, I may have dealt with that in my past before I was married with uh, certain girlfriends I've had. But that remembrance has long left me. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. All right, you are definitely blessed. Uh, uh, but you know, over over the years, uh, especially in the early years, uh, there were a lot of contentions and, and a lot of strife and difficult times between my wife and me. Uh, but uh, our love and commitment to each other was strong, and so we. I think that we both grew and matured as as people, and uh, uh, thankfully, we didn't throw in the towel as a lot of people do. Uh, the, the, the people who don't have a commitment to life to a lifelong marriage, they can uh, they can have a contention, and they immediately just give up and throw in the towel. And I'm so thankful that uh, uh, we didn't we didn't do that. We uh, and it's 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 paid off so that now uh, the I mean obviously there's a lot of relationships we have we have our relationship with our great Savior God Jesus we have our relationship with the brethren the Saints we have a relationship with our spouse with our children with our families and our friends they're all interesting and, and, uh, and varying uh, and and they can be wonderful and they can be difficult sometimes uh, but the, uh, the the relation between a husband and wife, uh, I think that it's probably only it's a second only to, to Jesus. I, I don't know. I don't think there's anything in the scriptures that says that our priorities should be God first, and then your spouse, and then your children, and then your ministry. And then, but I, I, I've heard that often said by people that that's the priority, how you prioritize. Uh, and I, I, I don't think I can find anything in the scriptures that would actually spell that out in that way. <clears throat> but I do think that the relationship between a husband and wife is is, is so important. It, it just it it almost rivals the the importance of a relationship with our Savior God. Uh, all right. I'm, I'll, before I go on, brother, any uh, anything else you want to add to that? I'm good, brother Luke. Let's go ahead. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Let me see. That's uh, got to scroll back to the KJV. Uh, and now we're on verse uh, fourteen. House and riches are the inheritance of fathers, and a prudent wife is from the Lord. All right. I, I, I think that's so straightforward. I don't know if anything needs to be added to that. Do you have, have anything to say about that? Um, I just wanted to uh, point out that... Uh, our responsibility is uh, our goods and possessions to our children and uh, the wife for our children uh, comes from the Lord. 
at least a prudent wife, if you're trusting in the Lord for that. Okay, back to you. Uh, yeah, I do think that the way you uh, explained the first part of that, house and riches are the inheritance of fathers. I mean, I uh, that is important to me that, you know, my son's not going to need anything from me. As I said, he's already successful in his own right. And uh, if, if I he inherited nothing from me, then he would still be doing great. But... I've always felt that uh, I, I want to make sure he doesn't hear something. I, I, I don't know. I just felt always that like it's a responsibility. It's, it's something, it's a goal in life. I, I don't want to just leave and then leave nothing as an inheritance. So I think the way you emphasize that, that I think that is an important thing and, and that uh, fathers should take this as a responsibility a serious responsibility to, hey, when we go to be with the Lord, uh, you know, what are we leaving for for our, our son, for our children? What kind of inheritance? That, uh, in fact, that's uh, my wife's mother passed away last Saturday. They had the funeral this Saturday, and this, this is their their estate is 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 now going to be settled and that's the kind of thing that uh when your parents are gone many times there is an estate there's an inheritance unfortunately sometimes the siblings uh, instead of uh being blessed by it it <laughs> can turn into a curse because it's it's not unusual for siblings to divide and fight over the inheritance and that's a real tragic sad thing when that happens Okay, let's um, go on to uh, the next verse. Uh, okay, verse 15. Good, I love this word. Slothfulness casteth into a deep sleep, and an idle soul shall suffer hunger. Brother? Wow, Brother Luke, it's been a long time since I've read this verse. And it really, really, really strikes a chord in my heart. And uh, the way I see it and the way I've experienced it is in my uh, ministry. Uh, for years I've been asleep and not doing anything with my ministry of reconciliation. And it was Due to my slothfulness uh, so I fell into a 40 year sleep just like Rip Van Winkle but I'm awake now <laughs> and now I'm gonna go big or go home okay back to you okay uh, for those people who may not know what slothfulness is uh, what, what is slothfulness brother Well, I would think it was just plain laziness, isn't it? Yeah, it's a, it's to me it's just a it, it, it's a great word. Uh, I guess it's there's an animal named a sloth, and I don't know if it's the word has anything to do with the animal. Uh, but uh, sloth, the slothfulness, is, just means laziness, and so. What happens when a person's lazy? Well, it says here in this verse that uh, cast us into a deep sleep. One of the things that people do when they're lazy is they spend too much time in bed. There's other verses in Proverbs that talks about a person that stays in bed and doesn't doesn't get up early and just spend too much time sleeping the day away. And that, that kind of laziness, slothfulness is uh, unproductive. And uh, you just uh, you lazy, so you just spend your day sleeping, and uh, uh, then the next part, though, to me, is not only an important principle for us as as uh, Christians, but today in America, 
uh, you know, there, for a long time in America, there's been a political debate about, uh, you know, big government and social programs and how much should the government be, be doing. And that's what this verse makes me, me think about. It, it says, um, it says, uh, an idle soul shall suffer hunger. Well, an idle soul is that lazy person again. It's still talking, the whole thing is talking about big person that's lazy, wants to stay in bed, doesn't want to get up and go to work and, that, and be a, a diligent, hardworking person. Uh, that person will suffer hunger, it says. Uh, Jesus said that we will always have the poor with us. And Paul said, if a person is not willing to work, then they should not be fed. Uh, now, I do believe that as a society, I mean, even apart from the body of Christ, just as a society like the United States, we're a nation, we're also a society. I think that we do have a collective responsibility to help each other. Uh, if, for example, if, if someone through no fault of their own, either through sickness or loss of employment, got poor and they couldn't they couldn't afford food, that we need, as a nation, we need to feed them. So I believe in this, like they call them food stamps, but I guess they get like a credit card, something like that, uh, to buy food. If someone is sick or old or not able to work and can't find a job, they, we can't let them go hungry and die. We need to help them. But if this person is lazy and not willing to work, they're able-bodied and not willing to work, and yet they want to get one of these cards and they want to just uh, live off the government and they're just being slothful, then uh, they should go hungry. Uh, so, yeah, we do have a responsibility to help people who need help. But we do. We also have a responsibility to to say, wait a second. You're able-bodied, and you're just being lazy, brother. What's your comment on that? Very good, brother Luke. And uh, so uh, we need to determine who's being lazy, and who really needs help, right? Yeah, right. And uh, like if. If a person uh, can't get a job, they're trying to get a job, then we need to give them some kind of unemployment or some kind of welfare uh, benefits uh, to help them. But we got to make sure that they are trying to get to work. They're not, they're, they're not lazy and, and help them. Uh, and, and then uh, even while they're trying to get to work, they ought to have to do some kind of work. I think, you know, the, a few years back, I remember they – they changed welfare to workfare. They said, "Okay, we'll give you welfare, but you got to work at least. We got to, we'll give you something to do because you, so you don't just get free money for doing nothing. Uh, at least pick up litter in the streets or something." Uh, so the idea of a person not being lazy and a free rider, a freeloader, uh, is biblical. All right, let's go. Let me see that in the Amplified and see how that phrases it. Amplified. Okay. Verse 15 in the Amplified says, Laziness casts one into a deep sleep, unmindful and uh, unmindful of lost opportunity. And the idle person will suffer hunger. Yeah. Yeah. And as I said, if a person is hungry and is and but they're willing to work and they just can't find work, then yeah, we can't we shouldn't let them go hungry. But if a person is being idle and just lazy, we we can't feed those people and give them uh, some kind of benefits. And we're only rewarding bad behavior, idleness, laziness. All right, brother. Uh, I think that's amplified. Makes it pretty clear. Let me go back to the KJV for the next verse. Okay, verse 16. 
he that keepeth the commandment keepeth his own soul, but he that despiseth his ways shall die. Okay, brother. Well, brother Luke, I find that interesting that uh, it's phrased in the singular uh, form, knowing that uh, all mankind is under one commandment, and that is to believe the gospel. And once they do, we're under one commandment to love one another. And I can prove this, and my lawyers approve of this doctrine. Okay, back to you, Brother Luke. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's all very, very true. Uh, the commandment, as you said, is uh, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and uh, put your faith in Jesus, and you've satisfied what God requires of us. And then after that, see, when you believe on Jesus, uh, Jesus, it, it, it's likened to being yoked. G Jesus said, my yoke is easy. My burden is light. So all you got to do to be yoked to Jesus, to his spirit, connected to his spirit, brought to life spiritually. All you got to do is believe on Jesus, trust him, and you get yoked to him. As easy as can be, just trust him. And then after that, what does he ask you to do? He says, well, my burden, the only burden I'm asking you to do is love each other. Now, we, we do it to varying degrees. Some succeed more than others. Some fail more than others. But that's what he's asking us to do. Well, you, now that you're born again, you're a child of God, will you love each other? So um, I, I, I like the way that you uh, see these things in Proverbs that's... Uh, let me see. Solomon was after date was David's son, and David was uh, a thousand years before Jesus. So uh, long before the cross, the death, the burial, the resurrection, long before that, we have these verses, and yet you see them. And you immediately see them in the perspective of today and, and, and uh, how we're to see them today in light of this gospel that we have, this uh, salvation through faith alone, Christ alone. So very good, brother. Uh, anything else before we go to the next verse? Wow, Brother Luke, I love how you use the, the hand to signify the yoke to Jesus. These are the Ten Commandments. The two tablets come together. And they form a heart and there's one commandment on that heart of flesh that God gives us and that's to love one another yeah I, I like that very much too so any times that we any any ways that we find to give a kind of a visual or a symbol uh, or, a, or some illustration that people can see to help them understand these concepts is uh, it, it's probably very helpful to people and I know that uh, when I see that kind of a thing that uh, you know it makes it crystal clear to me um, all right we only have a few minutes left let me see the next verse what it is and see if we want to go into that um, um, okay let, verse 17 I'm going to go to that next time let me make a note Okay, Proverbs, Proverbs 19, verse 17. That's where we'll pick up next time we study Proverbs. Uh, so let's close this off on Proverbs and let's make some final remarks here. We're talking, we, for some reason, you know, we always want to tell people about Jesus and salvation. I mean, no matter what we learn all through the scriptures, there's wonderful things to learn. But the one thing that is essential that you must learn is, is what do you have to do so you can go to heaven after you die? And uh, so we don't want to neglect that. Every single broadcast, we want to make sure that that's covered. Uh, and, and many times, though, these verses, even in Proverbs, as I said, uh, written probably about a thousand years before Jesus, 
uh, even as we read these verses, it, it makes us think of Jesus. It makes us think of our salvation. And so already we're talking talking about this uh, the, this uh, commandment, believe on Jesus, and uh, you'll be yoked to him. And then uh, after that, don't think that, you know, there's some burden on you to uh, join a religion and practice all the rituals and rites and requirements of the religion, become a religious person, follow a set of religious rules. No, that's, that's not what the Bible says is required of you. The Bible says there's one requirement. Put your faith in Jesus, trust him for your salvation, and you've satisfied all that's required. After that, then the Holy Spirit will live inside you and begin to transform you, change your desires and your thoughts, and and uh, um, you will love Jesus because the scripture says, we love him because he first loved us. When I first learned how much Jesus loved me, I couldn't help but love him in return. Uh, and I, that, that's just a natural reaction. It, it, Scripture says that uh, God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Another translation says God demonstrated his love for us. This is how God showed how much he loves us. That even though Brother Luke here, before I was Brother Luke, I was just Luke, and I was a sinner, even though I was a sinner, in spite of my sin, God showed me how much he loved me. Even as I'm a sinner, Christ would die for me and pay for my sins. So that's that's really what we want you to understand, that uh, uh, if you're not aware of biblical Christianity, the kind of Christianity you find in the Bible, uh, you, you probably think that to go to heaven, it's... Uh, it's a process of working, climbing a ladder, striving, trying to get up to heaven through good works, giving up the bad things, stopping your sinning, getting sin under control, and then doing a lot of good things like being charitable and loving. And, and, and uh, they think if you if you get rid of the bad things and do enough good things that somehow you'll be able to climb your way up to heaven. That's the way most people think it works. But uh, the Bible tells us no. We don't get through to heaven through our own effort, through our own works. You have to throw that whole idea away. It's doomed to failure because the Bible says we all fall short of the glory of God. If you want to work your way to heaven, the standard you must meet is perfection. Do you think you can live a perfect life? If you do, well, I want to have news for you. It's already too late. You already failed. So now, accept the fact that you're helpless and you need God to save you. Well, guess what? The name Jesus means God saves. So uh, Jesus is that Savior God. Give up trying to get to heaven on your own and throw in the towel, accept defeat, and say, Jesus, I need you to be my Savior. I'm going to rely on you to get me to heaven. He died for your sins, so now your sins are resolved. You can you can have a relationship with God because of what Jesus did for you. But he didn't stay dead. For three days he was in that tomb, and then he raised from the dead, victorious, glorious. And he said, he he's, the reason the resurrection is so important is because that's what gives me confidence that Jesus is who he said he is. He is God who became a man. He does have power over life and death. He does have the ability to resurrect me and give me life everlasting. And not only does he have the power and ability to do that, but he's promised it to me. And he's promised it to anyone who will put their faith in him. So do it now and you are guaranteed that you're going to go to heaven after you die. You're guaranteed it because Jesus promises it to you if you'll trust him completely. Brother, anything else you want to say before we close the broadcast? 
Thank you very much, Brother Luke. Uh, I agree 100% with that, and I hope and pray that all who are viewing and beyond will heed those words that you just spoke. Okay, thank you very much. All right, uh, Brother Eric, thank you for participating uh, tonight. Uh, the viewers, thank you for watching. Uh, these, these are live broadcasts. I'm attempting to do them daily, every day at 7 p.m. Pacific time here uh, in the East Coast in the United States. That would be every day from 10 p.m. And we're, we're trying to keep them just to about an hour long. Uh, we've got basically four different uh, subject matter that we're, uh, we're doing now. Book of Proverbs tonight. We're also studying the book of Job. We're also studying the Gospel of John, and we're, we just started a study yesterday of early church history. So please join us on these broadcasts. Thank you for watching, and bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus Christ.